Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Amen. Wow, so good to see you in the house of the Lord today. I, I really wasn't trying to knock her off the stage. I just trying to be, you know, ready. Uh, got a lot to talk to you about today. So if you will, let's just jump in. Daniel chapter 9, this, this really is not, not, not what I would call an easy word, and it's probably not what you expect when I call out the reference Daniel 9. You know, when you hear things, you like, uh, at least me, I have at least preconceived ideas that, well, let's just get into it. Daniel chapter 9, verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But to us, shame of face, as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries in which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they've committed against you. Verse 8, O Lord, to us belongs shame of face. To our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Take a moment, lift your hands to the Lord with me. Come on, everybody, lift your hands. Pray this prayer with me. Holy Spirit, open my ears that I can hear what you have to say. Open my heart, make it receptive. I give you permission to move deep in my life, to form my heart, to form my character. Jesus, have your way in me today. Amen. So this chapter starts by giving us the time frame of this event, when this took place. He said, it was in the first year of Darius the Mede. He was a descendant, of course, of the Medes. And he's first mentioned in Daniel chapter 5 when it gives us the story of Belshazzar's feast in which this supernatural appearance of a hand takes place. A hand appears and writes on the wall. That you've, you've heard the expression, the writing is on the wall. Well, that's where that comes from. And in what the writing is stating is you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And so... Belshazzar's kingdom is divided between the Medes, the Medes rather, and the Persians, and it concludes by that very night Belshazzar the Chaldean, the Babylonian king, is killed, and Darius the Mede becomes king. So the Medes were basically an Iranian people. They became a major political power in the Near East when they joined with the Babylonians and they overthrew the Assyrians. But it's, it's important, you need to get this, you need to understand the times that you're living in. You need to get this in your spirit. Understand the times. The tribe of Issachar was so special because they understood the times and they knew what to do. So it was at this time, in Daniel 9, that, that we, we, we get this insight that Daniel understood the time in which he was living and he knew what needed to happen. And so this chapter is a response to the understanding that Daniel had of the times. He had been, Daniel had been reading Jeremiah's prophecy. He had lived Jeremiah's prophecy. He, had, he was a young man. He was a young teenage, young, young fella, bright-eyed and, and of royal descent when, he came, when Nebuchadnezzar came and, and took captive all of Judah. He knew what it was to live 
all through this era, but he was back in Jeremiah's writing and in something began to click. Something went through all of the struggle that they have had in Babylon. In Jeremiah chapter 25, I can imagine Daniel's expression as he's reading Jeremiah 25, where thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard, in verse 8, my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants and against these nations all around and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take them from them the voice of mirth, mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstone and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. Daniel lived it. He knew what he was talking about. He experienced it. But here's the part. When he read this from Jeremiah's writings, and there was this collection of prophecies that they had that he was reading through, he read, They'll, they will serve the king of Babylon 70 years and he began to do the math in his head. Wait a minute now. I'm not a, I'm not a Ninos Mocosos anymore. I'm getting to be an old man. I've been in Babylon over 60 years. And he said they will serve 70 years. He understood that they needed to get ready because freedom was just around the corner. And so he begins, he begins to write these words that, you know, because he knew when the 70 years would be completed, that God would begin to punish Babylon. You know, we're coming in a time where the power of God is going to be released against the spirit of wickedness in the world. It's not just in America. Yeah, we've seen some stuff, but there, there's a, there's a, the spirit of Antichrist has been released and has been for a long time against the world, and there's only so much that God's going to put up with. Now, I want you to listen to this in the, the King James. O Lord, righteousness, Daniel 9, 7 to 9, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. That's what grabbed me. That phrase, confusion of faces. As it is this day to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, he goes on. And then in verse 8 he says, O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faces, to our kings, princes, fathers, because we've sinned. O Lord, to you belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Confusion of faces. The King James, New King James renders it shame of face. The ESV calls it open shame. To you belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. To you belongs righteousness, but to us shame of face. You ever heard that expression? You're probably too young to have heard this. Shame-faced that circumstance left him shamefaced. I, I don't know. I've heard that as a kid growing up. But I'm a lot older than you. Most of you. Some of you. <laughs> but when you really begin to look at that word that's translated shame, open shame, or confusion of face, there's, there's so much that's in it and so many pictures are being drawn. You know, in, in the Hebrew Every letter is a picture, every letter is a number, and it's, it's an incredible language, and God chose that to reveal his word in. And so one of the pictures that's, be, that's being drawn is a drying up of, of land, of streams, of plants, a withering, and, and it's like a wetland. Maybe you're familiar with that here living in coastal South Carolina. When a marsh, when a wetland dries up and the vegetation dies and the fish die 
and there's this foul odor that comes, there's a stink that comes to the land, the smell of a, of a dried up marsh. And it literally means something that stinks. It is uh, something that gives off a bad odor that is loathsome, a foul odor. And it brings uh, to mind a story that I've heard my mom tell out of pure disgust. My, my dad loved to hunt, and I'll deal a little bit more with that later. But he, he loved to hunt, and one, one night when he was out hunting, the dogs got, they didn't get a raccoon like they were supposed to. They got a skunk. <laughs> and the dogs got sprayed, and dad got sprayed. And so the story is he comes home, and, you know, you're, this is hunting in the middle of the night, you know. And he stinks to the high heavens. And that when he walks in the house, the whole house is permeated with the stench of that smell. And he takes his clothes off, and mom makes him go out in the backyard and burn them. Because there's no hope for that. You can't get skunk off your clothes. The only, the only thing he could do was burn them. Isn't that... Really, can you identify with that? Maybe sometimes we go through the fire because that's the only way to get the stink off of us. I don't know. This stuff applies to me, but I'm sure it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> that word is also used to describe the stink weed. Yeah. And, and here's another picture that it, that, it, it, that it draws, this confusion of face term. It is a person who's been exposed. I love, the, I love the way King James refers to this. Some places it's really explicit, and other places it's just really dignified. But it's referring to your secret parts. If you know what your secret parts are, your secret parts being exposed. I mean, literally, you know, you've heard the expression, caught with your pants down. That's where it comes from. Shame. The feeling of shame when someone has been exposed. When, when you've been dried up and withered and ashamed and confused. It's, it's, not, it's not a good feeling. But what I want you to get is this. Sin is the source Sin is the source of shame and guilt. Daniel knew that Judah had sinned, and as a result of their sin, they had the shame that came on them. And shame is such a powerful emotion. Do you know that much of addiction is empowered by shame? Shame is the motivation. What, what are people trying to do when they're addicted, when they, when they get involved in drugs and alcohol and pornography and sexual promiscuity in food addictions? What is it? They're trying to self-medicate because they can't deal with the shame of something that has happened in their life to them, in them, through them, against them. Self-medication. And so... Shame, if you look at the, the story, the history of the world, shame wasn't present. Shame was not in the garden until Adam sinned. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, and it gives it very clearly. In, two, in Genesis 2, 25, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. That's hard to wrap your modern brain around because if you're standing there naked, the first thing you do is cover up. But here they were naked and they weren't ashamed. There was no shame. There was no condemnation. There was no guilt because there was no sin. There was perfect transparency between the man and his wife and between the man, his wife, and God. There was no pretending. There were no facades. There was no trying to be something you weren't. There was no trying to cover it up and pretend it's not there. It was just open transparency minus shame. In all relationships, human and spiritual. So shame wasn't present. 
Examples of this confusion of face would be when God walks in the garden and he begins to call out, Adam, Eve, and what do they do? They hide. Can you imagine the expression on their face when they heard God coming in the garden? Shame of face, confusion of faces. It's the expression that Cain had when God confronted him for murdering his brother Abel. And God says to Cain, when Cain says, you know, am I my brother's keeper? And God says, your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. The look of confusion of face is what Moses had when he was confronted with killing the Egyptian who was abusing Hebrews. And the guy looks at Moses and says, are you going to kill me too? Whoa, somebody knows. It's the look that David had, King David. When, when the prophet Nathan confronted him, told him a story, and then looked him in the eye and said, thou art the man. It's the look that King Saul had when confronted by Samuel. And Samuel said, what is this lowing of the cattle and bleeding of the sheep that I hear? Shame of face, confusion of face. It's the expression that Judas had when he realized his betrayal was causing Jesus to be crucified. Confusion of face. That's the expression on Peter's face when Peter heard the rooster crow. And he realized he had denied Jesus three times. Confusion of face. That's the expression that was on Ananias' face when he lied to the Holy Ghost and got called on it. That's the same expression that was on his wife Sapphira's face when she was confronted with conspiracy to lie to the Holy Ghost and they both drop dead. According to the National Institute of Health, the National Library of Medicine, the National Center for Biotechnical Information, both shame and guilt may be experienced as unwanted and averse emotional states. Shame may be particularly pernicious due to its close ties with an individual's sense of self. Shame is closely linked with various psychological difficulties, including depression, psychosis, post-traumatic stress, and eating disorders. Across the available research, there's evidence that shame is more robustly associated with psychological difficulties. Guilt too, may be experienced as painful and may give rise to feelings of regret and remorse. While guilt may lead an individual to engage in reparative action to address perceived problematic behavior, responses to shame are typically less adaptive and include rumination. You just you can't get it off your mind. It's consuming your mind. Submission, isn't that what the devil wants to use shame in your life to make you do? Submit to his demonic power. He shames you so you don't fight against him. And it, and it also attempts to conceal oneself or one's perceived faults. You begin to hide. What did Adam and Eve do when confronted in the garden? They sewed fig leaves together because they were ashamed because they had disobeyed God. In the light of the available literature, it is hypothesized that shame will show a stronger relationship with self-harm than guilt. And here's the deal. Guilt is linked to what you do. Guilt is linked to behavior, while shame is linked to who you are. Self-awareness. The effect of shame. Now, for the sake of the story, we'll, 
we'll call this gentleman Hank. Hank is not his real name. But there might be somebody who knows Hank or knew him or related to him. It was 1973, and it was in a small rural community in Middle Tennessee. And my dad pastored a small church that was on the main highway between Woodbury and Smithville. I mean, this is about as rural as you get. And it was here that I spent some of the best times of my life, memories with my dad. Can you imagine being, I was at this time 10, 11 years old. You know, some of you are trying to do the math, don't. But being in the woods, like on a mountainside, with your dad at 12 o'clock midnight and nobody's telling you to go to bed, you're with your dad in the woods and it's winter and it's cold and there's snow on the ground and you hear the sound of the hounds as they're trailing that raccoon and they get him treed. Man, it just doesn't get any better than that. That is like the, the, the pinnacle of father and son bonding. But in this little rural church, Hank was a, he was a farmer. His family had farmed that area in Middle Tennessee for years. He was like a fourth generation farmer. And he, he was also an uneducated man. Hank couldn't read or write. He was a hard worker. He loved his family. He was faithful to attend church. He worked in the church. As a matter of fact, even though he was illiterate, he was the superintendent of Sunday school. He was a likable guy. But he was easily manipulated. And, and some of the wonderful people of that congregation, for some reason, didn't like the pastor. And so they stirred Hank up. They told him a lot of untruths. And at their behest, Hank becomes the representative, the spokesperson to have the pastor removed. And so Hank preferred charges against the pastor, accusing him of different acts of malfeasance. And it caused the state bishop to send down a regional overseer and have a formal meeting and the churches gathered. And I remember sitting on the front row as all of this is being dealt with, charge after charge is being read aloud and being dealt with. And at the end, when the pastor was completely exonerated and found no guilt in any area, it was a traumatic time. Can you imagine the trauma that that entire congregation went through, let alone the pastor went through. But not only that, the trauma that Hank went through. Hank was humiliated. He realized that he lost. But not, not only did he lose, he lost face. And then the realization of the manipulation and the lies and all of this stuff, it really begins to bear down on him. And so on December the 26th, 1973, Hank goes into his barn with a shotgun and ends his life. Don't tell me shame doesn't have power. Shame will kill you. Listen to me, friend. God deals with shame. You got to let him. God wants to deal with your shame. Adam and Eve hid themselves when they sinned, but on the cross of Calvary, Jesus took your shame upon himself. As a matter of fact, the book of Hebrews says, in Hebrews chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author of and the finisher of our faith, Look, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
So the first step to conquer your shame is get your eyes off of you and get your eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Jesus. Our faith begins with Jesus. Our faith ends with Jesus. The author and the finisher. Get your eyes off of you. Get your eyes off of your sin. You are not your failure. You are not your addiction. You are not your mistake. You are not a punishment. You are not a disappointment. You're a treasure. You're a prized possession. You're the apple of his eye. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not an accident. You are beautiful. You are created in the image of God. You are gifted. You are anointed. You are chosen. You are precious. You are beyond value. You are a priceless gift from God to your family to your community, to this world. So get your eyes off of yourself and off of your failure and look to Jesus. No one before or since can be compared to Jesus. Jesus said in Revelation 1, 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 11, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Do you understand what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary? He crossed out your shame. Jesus crossed out your shame at Calvary. The writer of Hebrews says, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, when we hear someone talk about the cross, it's hard to hear that term today and feel the emotion that was felt in Jesus' day. If you could take yourself back to the time where Rome controlled Palestine, controlled Israel, then, then you would know that the cross, we see it, as, and, and when I hear of the cross, I, I hear hope, you know, because I know what happened on that cross. But at that time, it wasn't a symbol of hope. It was the most detestable, despised form of public execution, the most humiliating form of execution. The, the person on the cross hung naked, completely exposed for all of the world to see. They were tortured beforehand. They endured such agony that many of them died in the process of scourging before they ever Ever got to the cross. So the cross is the ultimate picture of scorn and complete shame. But Jesus endured the cross despising its shame. The word despising in the, in the Greek language means to treat or regard with contempt, to despise, to disdain, to think little or nothing of. It's a verb. It's active. And this is what Jesus did. This is what it really means. It's, it's found in Isaiah 53. He's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. But surely he's borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But... He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's it. So make your confession today. No more shame. Look at the person next to you. Look them in the eye and say, no more shame. Jesus went to the cross to set you free from shame. 
Shame no longer has control over you. Shame cannot hinder you any longer. Shame will not be the motivating factor for your actions. Jesus not only allows you to cope, to deal with it, but he eradicates the source of your shame. That's why Paul could say in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Shame condemnation, guilt came to us because of the law of sin and death. But on the cross of Calvary, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that resurrected him on the third day, that spirit fills my mortal body and gives me the reason to put my past behind. My past is buried in the depths of the sea, never to be re- Remembered again. My past is separated from me as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed my transgression from me. You see, this message today is a message of hope for some of you who feel like you've just blown it too many times. You've given in to that addiction so often, you've become the addiction. You've given into that spirit of perversion so long it's become your identity. But I break that in the name of Jesus. Sin has no power over you any longer. Iniquity has no power over you any longer. He whom the Son has set free is free indeed. You are, I declare, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus that the old is gone and the new has come. This is a new day. This is a new dawning. This is a new time. This is a new hope. God has given you an opportunity to pick yourself up because Jesus lifted you from the miry clay and he established your feet upon the rock. So you don't leave here and worry about, am I going to do it again? Am I going to fall again? No, in Jesus' name. No, no, no. You will walk in victory. Victory. 